Thank you for welcoming us into your home for our online digital campus worship. We invite you to partake of this unique worship experience. As we gather today, we gather with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. May it be with you all. our hearts and minds this day for worship with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ in seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen.
Gracious God, your blessed Son came down from heaven to be the true bread that gives light to the world. Give us this bread always, that he may live in us and we in him. And strengthened by this food, we may live as his body in the world, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Hey everybody, so we've been talking a lot about Jesus being the bread of life. Okay, so I thought, you know, what better place to talk about bread of life than in front of the bread section. Right, so when we talk about, in this week's gospel, we talk about Jesus being the bread, that, you know, if you eat that, you'll never be hungry, and if you experience him, you'll never be thirsty. Well, I think that's kind of interesting because, like, of course you're going to be hungry. I mean... When it's time to eat, you gotta eat, right? I mean, you gotta give your body nourishment. You gotta, you gotta eat this stuff, right? So, is Jesus this kind of bread? Is he like water so that you won't be ever thirsty again? Because if you're running around outside to come in, you know you want a glass of Kool-Aid, you know? So, I don't know that it's necessarily like the physical being hungry or thirsty. We need liquid in our body. We need bread, right? We need this stuff. I mean, it would be awful to think that you're going to eat, you know, communion one week and then you're never going to have a hamburger again. No, I have to have cheeseburgers. But anyway, but I think what he's talking about is, you know, when you, when you experience Jesus, when you get a relationship with Jesus, you're not searching for more, right? You're not wondering for more salvation or, or something else, right? Jesus is pretty much the everything, right? When you saddle up with that when Jesus, when you turn around and see Jesus standing next to you because he's there all the time, you're gonna get to the point where you say, I'm good, right? I'm, I'm, it's not that you're not searching for more, it's not that you never necessarily want something to eat. It's just that your soul is satisfied and it's at peace. So you're not looking for the next thing. Right? I mean, little kids got to grow. This is my granddaughter. This is Harmony. Hey, you got to wave. Wave. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is my oldest granddaughter, Harmony. My oldest daughter, Ashley, she's holding the phone. But, you know, when I look at something like that, of course she needs to eat. Of course she needs to grow. She needs to be hungry. And there's a big difference between being satisfied and saying, I know it all, I'm done, I'm good, and searching for more. But it's that yearning that Jesus takes care of. It's the peace that you find when you're in a relationship with Jesus. When you say, no, Jesus has me, so I'm good. It doesn't necessarily mean you aren't going to go looking for more answers or searching out more of your faith or looking for that certain something that really keeps you going. But we're not talking about buns, right? We're talking about Jesus being the bread that gives you complete life. So I hope that kind of puts some sort of meaning to, meaning to it, and I hope that that satisfies you. So, thanks for watching. The first reading is 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4 through 8. Elijah went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm is 34, 1 through 8. I will bless the Lord at all times. The praise of God shall ever be in my mouth. I will glory in the Lord. Let the lowly hear and rejoice. Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. Let us exalt God's name together. I sought the Lord who answered me and delivered me from all my terrors. Look upon the Lord and be radiant and let not your faces be ashamed. 
I called in my affliction, and the Lord heard me and saved me from all my troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear the Lord and delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who take refuge in God. The second reading is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God, as beloved children, and live in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to the father no one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Gospel of the Lord. Years ago, when I was in seminary, I met what is literally my best friend that I've known now for several decades. And I will never forget the first three times that I met him. The very first time was they still had dorms back then. I, I lived in one. And the first day that we were moving to, into the dorms, you know, people were out in the hallways just um, meeting the new people, uh, getting acquainted, finding out who was there, meeting your neighbors. And so I was standing in the hallway with some people and we were talking. And all of a sudden, along the one wall of the hallway came this short guy, and he was plastered against the wall, and he was glancing furtively about, and every once in a while he would do this with his tongue. <laughs> and he inched by us, and we stared at him and thought, who is this weirdo? And he goes, I'm a lizard, and advanced down the hall. And that was it, and I thought, how did they let him in here? The second time I met him was a couple days later. My roommate and I were out at Walmart, Kmart, somewhere like that, and we were um, getting a couple things for the dorm room. And we met uh, that short guy and uh, uh, someone else and, that we knew from the seminary. 
And so we were standing and talking to the one guy at the end of the aisle, and all of a sudden the short weird guy grabbed one of the plastic rifles off of the shelf, came around the corner like he was ambushing us, and, uh, 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 and shot us, and moved down the aisle. And I thought, that guy is so weird. The third time I met him was in my dorm room, uh, later at night after the library had closed, after we were done studying, of course, uh, we're all training to be pastors. We would gather in a room and we'd sit there and argue theology. We liked doing that. And so there's a whole bunch of people in my room and we were talking about theology. And all of a sudden this little short guy comes in and he starts dominating the room and going into some crazy shtick. I don't know even what it was about. But one by one, I just noticed that people just quietly got up and exited the room until finally the last person to leave was my roommate leaving me alone in that room with this crazy guy. And I thought, what am I going to do now? As soon as he noticed there was no one else in the room but the two of us, he sat down in a chair, he dropped the shtick, he talked perfectly normal, and we've been best friends now for decades. The point is, this isn't who I was looking for in a friend, right? It wasn't what I thought I wanted, what I thought I needed. Notice how many eyes there were in those last couple sentences there. It was all about me. But God works in a different way, doesn't it? Jesus says it so clearly here. He says, no one can come to the Father. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. I love that image. God is drawing us. God is pulling us. God is inviting us. God is tempting us to him. He is always reaching out, and he is always reaching out with love. He's, he's attracting us. Another author put it beautifully. He said to God, he, he puts the words in God's mouth, you would not be searching for me if I had not first found you. When I heard that, I found it a relief. I found it a joy. Because so often, I, like so many of us, think that we need to be seeking God. And why aren't we finding him better? And what more need I to be doing? But that isn't the point. God has already found us and he's drawing us to himself. Remember years ago when I was confirmation, after the three years, it was getting towards the confirmation date, and so our teachers and our pastors were trying to um, get us to focus on, seriously, that, that we are going to be affirming our faith. We are going to be saying yes, that we believed in God. They always pointed out, you know, that at your baptism, that's when your parents and your godparents said yes on your behalf when they asked, are you going to believe in God? He said, now, you're young adults. Now it's your turn to speak for yourself and say, yes, I believe in God. And I wondered, do I have enough faith to affirm? And so I was praying about it, wondering, God, do, is there something more I need to do? do? Am I really confirming myself? Do I want to be telling the truth there? And it was bothering me until all of a sudden it just dawned on me, it just washed over me. There was never a point in my life where I had not known God. I had the privilege of being baptized. My parents brought me regularly to church. They taught me to pray. They brought me to Sunday school. They brought me now to confirmation. There had never been a point where I had been apart from God consciously. And so, yes, I had always had a faith that I could affirm. I had always been found by God. Thomas Merton, another great Christian, said it this way, when he realized this, he says, How far I have to go to find you, God, in whom I've already arrived. That's the struggle in our life. But it's our problem. It's our inability to see and to trust. But I think it's sad for God, too. He's always and only watching out, drawing us, inviting us, but we don't see. Another point in this text that uh, ties in with this, um, the people looked at Jesus and heard this invitation, and they were shocked. And they raised a, an interesting point. They said, 
well, this Jesus, isn't he the guy? We know his parents, Mary and Joseph. They're just the ordinary people here in town. Who does he think he is? But once again, we see God deliberately ignores what we value. Again, it's not all about us, what we think is important, what is impressive. And he wants us to get beyond ourselves, to see beyond ourselves. Someone has said that the trivial is always demanding. That which is trivial in life is always just in our faiths, demanding our attention. I don't know, I shouldn't pick on them, but the Kardashians. I mean, on a way they are brilliant in how they have managed to capture our attention and make us so interested in their little lives that we would follow them and make them billionaires. Politicians are always trying to do this, to grab our attention, to say something so provocative. They're so desperate for exposure. But on the other hand, the deepest things never impose themselves upon us. The deeper truths and realities of life and existence only invites. You know, it's not that God is hiding. If he's hiding, he's hiding in plain sight. He's right there in Mary and Joseph's son, not in some king far away, but right there in their own village. God is manifesting himself. He's right there, right here, if we look. But we make it all about ourselves, and we don't look. Remember years ago, I was going through kind of a, a crisis, a faith crisis, in fact. And I went to a workshop, and the leader there said, um, it would be good if I sought out someone as a spiritual director, someone who could walk me through my struggles in faith. And so I found um, one out, one of the nuns out at the uh, Annunciation Monastery south of town here. And um, in preparation for that, um, I had been doing a bunch of work on personality types and taking inventories, you know, to figure out what kind of um, personality type I had and how I uh, gained information and how I processed things. And I'd read a couple of books on what kind of spiritual practices were best for my type of personality. And so I went out to this uh, nun. She was an elderly, she was a short, she was a German from Russia, nun, no nonsense. And so I, she listened to me, that first meeting. And I told her about my crisis and my problems in my life. And I told her about my wonderful personality, my unique personality, and how I thought I was needed this kind of spiritual guidance in my life. And I um, talked about my uniqueness and my needs and my wants and my expectations. And at the end of it all, as we were closing off the session and we were getting ready, uh, she was gonna tell me what I needed to do before the next session. She says, all right, Steve, this is what you're going to do. She forgot everything I was worried about, my uniqueness, my wants. She realized they were keeping me from seeing God. She knew how God was drawing me, and she wanted me to see that. So when I could slow down, I could see what God was doing in my life. And that's what we talked about in our meetings after that time. Where was God, not out there, but where was God in my life, in my, ex in my existence? And finally, I could come to know and experience that he had been waiting for me there all along, always drawing me. And we all need to learn this, but it's so hard for us to get this, to just trust that. Um, Good Shepherd has a wonderful policy that it's a full-time staff. Every five years they offer them a sabbatical, a month off for learning new things, but also for refreshment, for renewal, for uh, new perspectives, gaining new perspectives. And uh, just recently, our parish administrator, Melanie, had come back from one. I asked her if I could tell about this. She said, uh, when I went into this, I thought, I have to get this right. I have to do this right. I have to make good advantage of this time. I have to learn this. And uh, when she was talking to me about preparing for it, she's, she had a whole list of things to do. And I thought, you're never going to get through all those in a month. You're going you're gonna to drive yourself crazy trying to achieve this. 
Well, when she came back, she said, you know what, you're right, you're right. She said, I spent the first three weeks of my time off just stressing over that, thinking I'm not getting all this done, it's not gonna get all this done, until finally I just realized, I'm gonna let it go. <laughs> I'm just gonna let things happen. And she said, the moment I drop that, God could swoop in and let me know that he cared about me just the way I was. And the last week, when I didn't worry about any of that, when I just let God speak to me, were the best time that I had on that sabbatical. The trivial is always demanding our time. The deepest never imposes. It waits for us to clear a space until we can finally hear that calling, feel that drawing of God. That's what the prodigal son is all about, isn't it? The father knew that that son would not experience much of life outside of his own home. He knew that was where his real life was. That was where he knew love. But he didn't stop the son. He knew he couldn't. He knew the son had to go off on that journey. He knew that the world called his son, and that voice was loud, and he had to go out and experience it for himself, that it wasn't meeting his needs. And what the father did was waited. He knew he couldn't force his son to see what he already had right there. But he was there, waiting, waiting eagerly to embrace his son, draw him into his own new life as soon as he appeared on the horizon. One final point I want to make from this text. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless drawn by the Father. And then the people look at him and say, but who is this guy? Isn't he just the most ordinary person? Isn't he just some nobody? And we like to think, well, I'm nobody. What can God be doing with me, through me? Why would I even bother? But the point here is that is exactly who God is drawing. He wants to work in you, through you, as you. Who else? How else would he work in this world? This uh, past week I was listening to uh, uh, a podcast about one of the saints, one of the mystics, St. Teresa of Avila. She entered the monastery, she became a nun. And you know, when they entered the monastery, they often take a, a name of a saint or some religious person that, that they're going to aspire to, to use that person as a model for their life, for their time in the monastery. And the name she took was Teresa of Jesus. She took the most impressive model of all. And as she grew in her faith, as she grew closer to God, as she worked harder and harder to, uh, to please Jesus and serve him and become Teresa of Jesus, said one day she had this strange vision. While she was praying in her room, all of a sudden, a young boy appeared there. And she was startled, and she looked at him, and he said, Who are you? She says, I'm Teresa, Jesus, the name she took the aspiration she had. And in her surprise, she looked at him and said, and who are you? And he says, I am Jesus of Teresa. Do you see the turn there? He turns the perspective again. While she was trying to live up to some high ideal, he was simply trying to live his life, to manifest himself in her as simple Teresa in this world. And when she yielded herself to that, she became the saint that God had always called her to be. May we always be still enough and quietness, quiet enough to hear Jesus drawing us, calling us to our true selves. Amen.
Please join me in confessing the faith that we share in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the Church, the world, and all of creation. For the Church of Christ in all its diverse forms, for mission developers, new mission starts in all communities of faith, experiencing and exploring new models for ministry for the sake of the gospel, the congregations facing difficult decisions about their future. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the health and well-being of creation, for shade trees that provide refuge from the hot summer sun, for lakes, rivers, and oceans contaminated by pollution, and all who lack clean water. We ask, Lord, for rain that would come in a due and timely season. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those called to positions of authority in our legal systems, we pray. For judges, lawyers, law clerks, and court employees, who ensure the fair administration of justice. For corrections officers and prison chaplains, that they would deal mercifully with those who are incarcerated. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who cry out to you in their afflictions, for exiles, refugees, and others who face long and difficult journeys, uncertain about their future. For all who mourn the death of loved ones. For all who are sick, especially those whom we name in our hearts. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For this assembly gathered around your table, we pray. For those among us who bake bread and prepare the vessels for our communion celebration. For those who bring the food from this table to those who are homebound or hospitalized. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who have been raised to eternal life, we give thanks. With all the saints, we praise you for the bread of life that keeps us in your love forever. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O God confident in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always and also with you. Just a couple of announcements that I'd like to lift up for you today. Um, we're coming very uh, quickly to the close of the summer and our staff is so excited about uh, church school, Sunday school, and confirmation activities and the plans that they've made. What would really help though with the planning is for you to register and make sure that your kids, that we are prepared for them and you can do that online. So please contact us for that. Also, we are once again having our rummage sale here. That's going to be August 28th. And if you'd like to drop off some stuff for that, you can bring that down to the fellowship hall. If you need some help hauling that, call the church office. And then finally, and what is most exciting, is Rally Weekend is right around the corner. That's going to be September 11th and September 12th. We've got full um, 
complement of activities going on there. Um, we're going to have a ministry fair, there's going to be food, we're going to have a chance to welcome our new senior pastor, Pastor Rindy. So join us for the fun and the fellowship that will happen at that time. So that's all the announcements I have for today. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body, for the life of the world. Amen. As we gather for our meal this day, we gather with the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. Through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life, and so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. supper he took the cup gave thanks and gave it for all to drink from saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin do this in remembrance of me Lord remember us in your kingdom as you taught us to pray our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
I invite you to take the elements you have at home with you. Take your bread or cracker. Take and eat it, knowing that this is the body of Christ given for you. Take your wine or juice, knowing that this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and fill you with his grace. Go in peace. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we can ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. As we are sent forth from this place, we go with the blessing of God, who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us. May it be upon you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God.